Hello, my name is Jorge Cortez from the Georgia Cancer Center, and I'm going to be speaking today about 20 years of uh, progress in uh, leukemia, chronic myeloid leukemia, through 20 years of LLM. And uh, I'm going to focus on some of the things that we've learned, but also emphasizing some of the areas where there's still some controversy and we don't know uh, quite yet. Very important is that today we can say that a patient that is diagnosed with chronic myeloid leukemia will have a life expectancy that is very close to that of the general population. But that is provided that we can provide the proper care, that we have access to the drugs, that the patients are properly monitored, that the patients are properly uh, managed for all the uh, other uh, health issues that they will face during the treatment of their disease. In that case, then this uh, slide showing that normal life expectancy really applies. Well, let's step back then 20 years ago when we started with the treatment with that uh, drug that in those days we called STI-571, which uh, appeared as a novel agent, uh, uh, the first in class tyrosine kinase inhibitor uh, with very remarkable results in the preclinical studies that were done by Brian Drucker. And that was led then uh, to a phase one study. And it was very interesting uh, when I was fortunate enough to be part of that initial development in those days as a fellow. And patients going into this phase one study uh, that had failed multiple prior therapies, some of them already had transplant. And we started seeing these uh, great rates of response. Almost everybody had a hematologic response and at least half of the patients had a cytogenetic response. Uh, and that already started showing that excitement of this uh, novel therapy that was really first in class, not only for CML, but first in class in terms of targeted therapy. Um, it is important to remember that we actually also did not find a maximum tolerated dose. Uh, the dose that was selected, which was 400 milligrams once daily, was because it was already so uh, effective and it was felt that it was enough to go to a phase uh, two study. Well, um, the, uh, the drug, as I said, uh, was developed approximately 20 years ago. So we recently uh, showed at ASH uh, last year, the 20 year follow-up of the patients treated at MD Anderson with imatinib after interferon failure, which was the first phase two study that was uh, initially introduced. And you can see there's about 150 patients that uh, were uh, treated. And um, uh, interestingly enough, there's still a good number of patients, uh, 20 of these patients that still remain on therapy after all these many years. And you can see the results uh, on the left of the table. Uh, of course, uh, the response rate, complete cytogenetic response was very high. Uh, but also very important, the molecular responses. You can see that nearly 40% of patients have achieved an MR 4.5, uh, and 25% have achieved a sustained MR 4.5. And you see those cumulative rates on the top right. Uh, and, and most important, the, uh, the long-term survival outcomes, where you can see the uh, overall survival um, is uh, excellent uh, with... Uh, with a, uh, a transformation-free survival that has not even reached a, a median because so few patients have actually transformed to the accelerated and the blast phase. Well, that led to the development of imatinib as frontline therapy. And the initial study was a randomized trial uh, that compared imatinib to interferon and uh, cytarabine, the standard of care at the time. And we all know that the response rate was remarkably better with imatinib. Uh, but initially, we did not see a survival benefit. But recently, we had the publication of the 10-year follow-up of this trial called the IRIS trial. And you can see that now we can see that uh, survival benefit in favor of the imatinib-treated patients. And that is remarkable because uh, the great majority of patients on the interferon arm by one year had already crossed over to imatinib. So in essence, we're talking about imatinib uh, from the beginning to imatinib a few months later, and still we see a survival benefit, small, but it emphasizes the importance of early treatment with imatinib um, in, this, uh, in this context. Then came a number of uh, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and you see here the molecular structure of all the 
the, the ones that are approved today, imatinib, and then the second generation, the satinib, nilotinib, and bosutinib, and then the last one, the ponatinib, a third generation TKI, the one that can uh, address the T359 uh, multi-resistant gatekeeper mutation. Well, um, all of these drugs uh, were initially approved uh, for uh, treatment failure um, for second or, or in the case of panatinib, uh, mostly third line uh, therapy, uh, but also the second generation TKIs were compared to imatinib and the three of them were approved for initial therapy on patients with CML in chronic pace. And you see here a, a, a summary of the results of, uh, of these studies. The decision, the satinib, uh, an estendine, elotinib, and then the before and the bela, both of them are bosutinib uh, trials. And you can see in the solid uh, curves at the bottom that at least in terms of major molecular response, which is what I'm showing you here, the results are really overlapping. They all show a, a significant uh, uh, similarity in terms of the rate of molecular responses, and all of them are uh, better than the control arm, which is uh, shown in the broken curve with the corresponding same color uh, for each one of the trials. It is interesting, however, that the most recent of the studies, which is the BELLA trial with Basutinib versus Imatinib, shows a, 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 a big uh, uh, difference in terms of the major molecular response for the imatinib arm, much better than any of the imatinib arms that we had seen in the prior studies. Yet, posutinib was still better uh, than the uh, control uh, with, uh, with imatinib. Um, and based on all of these studies, is that these three drugs are now approved and available as initial therapy for CMF. Let me show you one of these studies uh, with more detail because we have uh, long-term follow-up, the 10 years of follow-up with uh, an STND, which is the nilotinib trial. You will remember that this study had two arms of nilotinib, one using 400 milligrams twice daily, which was the dose that was uh, being used for salvage therapy, still the standard today for salvage therapy, and nilotinib 300 milligrams twice daily, which became the standard for frontline therapy, <clears throat> and of course, the control of imatinib. Well, with 10 years of follow-up, what we have seen is that the rate of major molecular response continues to be superior for nilotinib. Uh, those curves uh, that uh, were evidently separated uh, with a higher rate for nilotinib very early on at one year, you saw 55% versus 27%. And these curves remain uh, separated at 10 years, 77% versus 62%. And more important, the rate of MR 4.5 uh, is much better with, uh, with nilotinib at 10 years, the, the incidence is 61% uh, versus 39%. Uh, so a much better uh, probability of achieving these molecular responses. However, uh, in the uh, progression-free survival and overall survival, we don't see a difference still after 10 years of follow-up. Um, and now that is probably not very surprising because with the response rates that we see with imatinib, with more than two thirds of patients achieving a complete cytogenetic response with imatinib, uh, it, it is hard to believe that we're gonna improve the survival any better. Uh, so the benefit comes more from the achievement of the deep molecular responses. We also acknowledge the fact that we see a higher rate of arterial occlusive events, as we see in the bottom curve here. Uh, and I'm gonna be referring more to this uh, issue uh, in subsequent slides. So when we see a patient uh, today in the clinic, newly diagnosed, our first question is, what are we gonna use as frontline therapy? What, are we gonna use imatinib or a second generation TKI? The reasons why you could consider imatinib is because there is longer follow-up, uh, as much follow-up as we have, for example, with an STND, and the IRI study is even older. Uh, there is fewer arterial occlusive events, and again, we're going to be talking about these uh, later on, and there is really no benefit in event-free survival or overall survival uh, we, uh, with the second generation, and we have effective salvage if the patient has failure to imatinib, and of course, because imatinib is now generic, we, we have a cost-benefit uh, as well. Why would we choose a second generation TKI then? Well, we have faster responses. The responses occur much earlier. There are deeper responses. We actually have more responses 
And more important, we have more sustained deep molecular responses, which is important when we're thinking about treatment-free uh, remission. We also have fewer transformations, uh, which is very important because that's a stage that we don't want to reach with any patient. And although we don't see an event-free survival benefit, there is a trend for fewer events in patients treated with second generation TKIs. So <clears throat> now let me dwell a little bit more on this issue of the deeper molecular responses. You see at the top, uh, the results of an SND that I showed you earlier, and uh, on the top right decision, both of them showing a significant benefit at five years uh, for the uh, achievement of MR4.5. At the bottom left, you see CML4. This is a study with imatinib only. And you can see that at five years, you are at the 30%, just like uh, with an SND and decision with imatinib. So there is remarkable uh, uh, consistency on this five-year uh, rate of uh, MR4.5 with imatinib. But at 10 years on that German study, CML4, uh, the imatinib patients treated do reach that 60%. So they, do, they can get there. It just takes uh, a, a longer, uh, twice as long. Now you see in the middle uh, bottom and on the right bottom, that there are two studies, Tidal 2 and MD Anderson, that show 60 to 80% rates of uh, deep molecular responses with imatinib. The big difference in these two studies is that they are using higher doses of imatinib than the standard, not 400, but 600 and 800 respectively. And there was a study that randomized patients to receive 400 versus 800 of imatinib. That is the top study that you see on the far right here. And as you can see, when you compare some of these parameters, uh, like the uh, major molecular response at three months, and the rate of transformation and, and others, they look very similar to the comparisons of second generation versus standard dose uh, imatinib. So there is a suggestion that higher doses of imatinib may provide significant benefit to these uh, patients. One of the issues that uh, needs to be addressed is the treatment discontinuation. You see here the rates of treatment discontinuation for both the second generation TKI and for imatinib at two years, which is very constant that around 20 to 30% of the patients have already discontinued therapy. At five years, about 40% of patients have already discontinued therapy. And by 10 years, almost 50% of patients have discontinued therapy. And that's about the same for imatinib and nilotinib. So it is very important that as good as these treatments are, we are discontinuing therapy, whether it's justified or not. And in my opinion, we're uh, discontinuing therapy a little bit too much than more than is needed. But we are discontinuing therapy by 10 years in about half of the patients. So that means that half of the patients do not meet our expectations, whether they meet the criteria of failure or not. So... Um, and, and this is important because when we look at the, uh, at the evolution of the survival in patients, uh, we can see on the left uh, how it has uh, progressed uh, uh, in, in, in the population of patients treated at the MD Anderson. But on the right, we can see that in the demographics, in the, in the general uh, uh, epidemiologic data from SEER, we do see that progress, but it's not quite the same as we see at MD Anderson. So that progress has not reached the same level in, uh, in, in every patient. Some of that may have to do with access to the drug. Some of that may have to be to do with selection of patients. Some of that may uh, have to do with the uh, monitoring and management of the patients. There are many variables, but certainly we have not made as much progress in every patient as we could do. The next question that we want to address is the issue of dose. And this is a complicated slide, but it shows that the dose uh, in many settings uh, for both salvage and frontline has changed. We know that um, in the frontline setting, the standard dose for nilotinib and for bosutinib is different than the dose that we use for salvage. That has not happened with dasatinib, but there is data to suggest that we need uh, a lower dose uh, for uh, dasatinib in the frontline setting. So let me go um, showing you a, a few examples of how the dose may be uh, changing some on how, how, how we consider this issue of dose. First, let's talk about uh, bosutinib in salvage. This is a study that was recently presented 
it, de it deals with older patients, patients uh, 60 or older that have received one prior therapy and are switching to, the, to bosutinib. Um, instead of using the 500 milligrams, which is standard, uh, they started the patients with 200 milligrams. By two weeks later, they increased to 300 milligrams. And then according to the response at three months, they, were, uh, they either increased to 400 milligrams, if not optimal, or they remain at 300 milligrams. And you can see here at six months how the 50% the, uh, the of patients had already achieved a major molecular response and the cumulative incidence of major molecular response is 65%. And they reduce the toxicity greatly. So that seems to be a, a, a reasonable way to use in this drug, particularly on these older patients. We also have seen these results from MD Anderson, my former institution, where we started using 50 milligrams as initial therapy for patients with newly diagnosed chronic phase. And as you can see, the results have been excellent, very much the same as we saw initially uh, with a 100 milligrams daily of dasatinib, suggesting that a lower dose may be uh, useful and safer for patients um, in, in this uh, context. And finally, in the, uh, this study of uh, ponatinib, where there is a concern, of, uh, concern about arterial occlusive events, where the randomized study called OPTIC, looking at 15, 30, or 45 milligrams, uh, it shows that with 45 milligrams, uh, the, the efficacy is significantly higher than with 30 or 15. Uh, and there is very little difference between 30 and 45 in terms of the risk of arterial occlusive events, suggesting that um, the risk benefit uh, favors the 45 milligrams. Now, granted, in this study, patients after achieving a response, they reduce their dose from 45 to 15 milligrams daily. So there are many dosing considerations that need to be taken in, in, into account. Then let's talk about the three-month response. We know that the patients that achieve a three, a less than 10% uh, at uh, three months of transcript levels have a better overall survival and event-free survival. Uh, however, look at the differences. They are significant, but they are relatively small. So the question is, what do you do for these patients uh, when, when they don't have a response by three months? But let's say that the patient already has greater than 10% of three months. What do you do for that patient? There is one randomized study recently published that uh, randomized those patients to either continue with imatinib or change to dasatinib. And the primary endpoint was the achievement of major molecular response at 12 months. And as you can see on the graphic on the left, uh, more than twice as many patients then achieved that major molecular response at 12 months if they changed to dasatinib. So that is good. However, it did not change the overall survival or the progression-free survival in this setting. So there is an early benefit, but there's not a later benefit. So the question is, what do we do? If we have these patients and we look at the, uh, at the, the possibility of event-free survival, certainly the, the ones with the greater than 10% have a lower event-free survival. So you could ask yourself, are we gonna change therapy for all of these patients, even though really only about 15 to 20% of the patients need uh, uh, help? Or, are we, uh, or should we better identify those 20% to see which ones uh, should change the therapy? Well, that was the purpose of uh, an analysis that was recently performed based on the NSTND population, try to identify biologic measures of those patients that are not gonna be good responders and the ones who are gonna be good responders. And you can see on the left that the good responders have a, an overexpression of genes associated with uh, immunity, suggesting that there is an immune benefit, uh, an immune component of having a good uh, response. Whereas the, the not good responders have uh, an overexpression of genes associated with metabolism and cell cycle. So this is early data, but it may be a better way to define these, uh, these responses. Now, what about these deep molecular responses? Do we have an additional benefit? Do we, is there a benefit in survival? You can see on the left that there is no benefit in survival for patients who achieve a deep molecular response uh, as long as they achieve a complete cytogenetic response. Uh, there is a, a benefit in failure-free survival, but not in overall survival. 
Now, of course, the main benefit for the deep molecular responses uh, is the probability of uh, getting to a treatment discontinuation. This is a concept that was introduced by, uh, by uh, French investigators and Australian investigators in the STEAM and TWISTER studies respectively. Uh, and it showed that you can stop therapy in some patients who have a sustained deep molecular response for at least two years. And grossly about 40 to 60% of patients can maintain a major molecular response. Now, this is a, a, a very strict criteria. So to, to try to uh, get more patients eligible, the Euroski Euro uh, study used uh, a more relaxed criteria, MR4 instead of MR4.5, and sustained uh, by only one year. And you see here that you still see some patients that get a, a, a treatment-free remission. But when you put these studies side to side, you can see uh, there are some differences. First, at two years, you get many more patients that, are, uh, that do not relapse when you use the more strict criteria, MR4.5 for at least two years. And you also see that there is a plateau, whereas on the Euroski, there is no plateau, that curve continues to drop over time. So in my opinion, you really need to use the more strict criteria. Now, <clears throat> in, in the data from the MD Anderson, what we saw is that if you wait and, and uh, uh, have an MR4.5 for at least five years, the probability of uh, losing the response as you see on the right hand here uh, drops significantly after five years of sustained MR4.5. So that may be a reasonable approach to consider in these patients. A couple of things to remember in uh, treatment-free remission. Number one, in this study recent from France, uh, there are relapses that occur late, as late as five or six years. 14% of all the relapses have occurred after two years. Number two, there have been individual isolated instances, but some instances reported of patients who lose a response in blast phase. This is rare, but it can occur. So it emphasizes the need for continued monitoring. Finally, in terms of toxicity, we know that the, to that the different drugs have different uh, toxicities. I'm not gonna go into detail in all of them, uh, but one that I want to emphasize is arterial occlusive events. We know that uh, both nilotinib and dasatinib, according to the five-year data from the randomized studies, double the risk of cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events compared to imatinib. But sutinib seems to have uh, a, a bit of a less, lesser risk in terms of the second generation uh, TKIs compared to imatinib. I also want to remind you that there is the potential for some renal dysfunction, at least with imatinib, you see the drop on the left on the glomerular filtration rate uh, over time. And there is some of that also with basutinib, whereas we don't seem to see that with dasatinib or with nilotinib. And finally, uh, what, what about transplant? Do we use transplant? Well, these analyses that we did recently comparing patients treated with TKI versus patients from the stem cell, from the bone marrow transplant registry suggests that for uh, patients in chronic phase, there is a benefit for the use of TKI. In accelerated phase, the survival is similar. In the blast phase, there is a benefit for stem cell transplant. So uh, this uh, uh, summary slide just uh, reminds us that as the treatment has evolved, our monitoring tools have evolved, and so have our endpoints and the goals of the patient. We're now we're focusing more and more in treatment-free remission. What does that mean for my career in the next 20 years? Well, I may need to look for something else to do because we are doing much better, but there's no question that we still have some, some uh, questions to address in future research. So I will conclude uh, with, this, uh, with this quote that says, in youth we learn and in age we understand. We learned a lot with the TKIs. Now we need to understand better how we're gonna use them uh, in the best way possible to improve the outcome for all our patients uh, with CML. With that, I conclude and I thank you for your attention.